In the early years of the 17th century, an extraordinary phenomenon burst upon Europe. And that phenomenon was the Society of the Rosy Cross. This is probably one of the great mysteries of literature, and perhaps one of the great mysteries of history. This society issued a series of proclamations of which the Fama and Confessio Fraternitatis are the most famous. These manifestos announced a reformation of Europe, a universal reformation, in fact, a major change in the thought and life of mankind. That such works could come into existence meant that already what we call the Reformation had accomplished a large part of its labor. Man's mind was liberated from the tremendous orthodoxy that dominated the medieval world. At the same time, a series of rather brilliant intellectuals were experimenting on the fringe of what we call today philosophic humanism. It had not occurred to these first humanists to break the ties with the past. What rather they hoped to accomplish was to bring about a restoration of the best of the past, to use man's long journey as a way of introducing him into a new way of interpreting uh, the available information and correcting the fallacies of the existing condition. There was no decided or distinct break with the past. There was rather a reinterpretation of past events. We can sense this in all of the utopian uh, writings, for they have this one common uh, theme, namely that regardless of how they sought to uh, create the concept of a better commonwealth, they always traveled to some distant place by one experience or another, being lost at sea or shipwrecked or lost in deserts or whatever the case may be, they always came in the end to a fair place that had existed for a long time. Somewhere in the distant parts of the world was the ideal community. It had not been discovered because its location was remote and far from the ordinary courses of human trade and traffic. This ideal city, however, stood with its battlements, its walls, its moats, or whatever seemed to be the proper uh, equipment of the time. The principal difference was that it was a well-regulated city. It was Nuremberg or Heidelberg or London or any one of the cities of the time but reformed, enlightened, the obvious weaknesses and corruptions of society corrected, and a better and more progressive attitude uh, reigned in this mysterious and distant city. Uh, the practical foundation for many of the utopias seems to have been the, re the development of the cantonal republics of Switzerland. The Swiss had already come to a rather advanced sociological state, while much of Europe still languished in its own uh, despotisms. The Swiss cantonal system, with its tolerances, with its cooperative attitude toward life, was of great interest to all practical thinkers of the time. And there is no doubt that the Switzerland served as an archetype for a number of the utopian productions. But this was not the full story. The full story was actually that man, looking about him for the first time, free from the oppression of the existing patterns, began to examine these patterns, find fault with them, observe how they could be changed, corrected, or improved, and dared to state what he had discovered in some articulate way. He could no longer be burned at the stake for suggesting that something was wrong with his way of life. This newfound intellectual freedom 
produced a wave of rather progressive types of work, many of them extremely interesting. Of course, the classic of all the utopias is Moore's Utopia. And in this work, we find the beginning of a whole sequence of reflections upon existing evils. And these daydreams became quite interesting and articulate, and in many instances undoubtedly contributed to the rise of the Western democratic concept of living. I think we can say of Moore's Utopia that it suffered from the common ailments of these books, namely that it was rather stuffy. Uh, stuffy in the sense that if we read it today, we would not think it very progressive. We would feel that it was dogmatic, that it had about it too much of regimentation, that actually the individual uh, seeking a new freedom from one corruption fell under slavery to reform itself. So that instead of coming to liberty, he came to a classification, uh, which also is of some disturbance to people today, who wonder if a highly socialized system developing here would gradually destroy most of the individuality and freedom of expression of our modern way of life. But in spite of the restrictions and limitations of perspective that we might uh, expect and must accept, we see that these people were working primarily uh, toward a, a concept of universal education, a concept of universal suffrage, a concept of e equality, of opportunity, of equity, and of the rights of man before the law and court of his time. Each in its own way was a proclamation of a Bill of Rights. The next of these interesting utopian works, of course, was Campanella's City of the Sun. Uh, Campanella recognized that ecclesiastical tyranny was no less than that of the civil courts, and that it was not much different whether the individual be dominated by the clergy or by the aristocracy. This, as you can well understand, was not particularly pleasing to the church, and it uh, uh, moved in upon Campanella and treated him pretty badly. But the principle involved was the same, that this escape uh, from domination also had to mean escape from superstition. It had to be release from spiritual authority, which in partnership with temporal authority um, afflicted the common man. So Campanella's City of the Sun was also a rather theological community, rather suggestive in many respects of a well-ordered monastery, but at the same time there was in it this desire of man to find practical ways of creating a solution to war, a solution to hate, a solution to fear. And in the beginning years of the 17th century, those problems which again loom large in our thinking were beginning to really dominate the popular mind. Probably the smuggest and most delightful of the utopias is that of the German theologian Johann Valentin André, whose book, Christianopolis, uh, was highly uh, uh, influenced by the culture of Switzerland. But out of his entire experience, he began to develop uh, a more or less Protestant theological utopia, in which, guided by the essential principles of Lutheranism, there was to be this new community dedicated to the equality and uh, fundamental security of men. Uh, Luther, of course, uh, cannot be blamed for André's concepts, but in his own way, Luther also, during his lifetime, expressed many of these same principles. And uh, therefore, André undoubtedly drew much inspiration from the writings of Luther himself. In this commonwealth, uh, which uh, André envisioned, there was considerable emphasis upon the economic state of man. Uh, the others were more philosophical, more abstract. But André, who was much interested in labor movements in Europe, even in his own, own time, and was one of the first to develop a 
cooperative to take care of and protect the widows and orphans of laboring people. So it was a kind of city of proletariat philosophers, uh, philosophers that uh, were not scholastic or academic, academic, but were thoughtful persons to whom security brought the right to be thoughtful, the privilege to think, and the mind could be relieved from the very great emergencies of daily existence. This type of thinking also uh, permeated other utopian productions of that period. There is also much proof and many uh, documents to sustain the fact that Bacon and Andre and Campanella were in communication with each other. And it is quite possible that a good many of these utopian productions arose in a common factory of the minds, uh, inspired by a definite purpose. And that purpose was to support and advance the Universal Reformation as expounded in the Fama and Confessio Fraternitatis. In any event, the New Atlantis has been tied in many ways to the Rosicrucian problem. We also know that Newton uh, and uh, many other important men of his time, scientists and uh, architects, leaders of thought, belong to a group called the Society of the Unknown Philosophers. This has likewise been traced, and we find that it arose among the same group that later integrated the Royal Society. Thus, out of the uh, College of the Six Days' Work, an actual physical institution did ultimately spring. This brings us to the subject of the New Atlantis, which was produced by an entirely different type of person. This uh, work, in fact all of the others included, seem to have risen from this idea of a universal reformation of mankind. This reformation was the very uh, pro uh, pronouncement of all the utopias that a new kind of life was opening for man. This new life was a related somewhat also to the Western Hemisphere, to the, to the development of a great new country where plantations could be established. It is very probable that uh, the Rosicrucian manifestos in the utopias were both to a degree keyed to the development of the Western Hemisphere. The most interesting of these works to us is Lord Bacon's because of the tremendous implications that are involved in the book and which surround it. We also realize uh, from our own thinking and studying that Lord Bacon was almost certainly deeply and closely involved in the rise of the Rosicrucian uh, society in England. We also have reason to suspect that the society was actually founded in England, although uh, the manifestos would attempt to move it to Germany. <laughs> 